break the power of our past, we must be reborn from above. And being reborn from above includes uh, sometimes being naked and exposed. The truth of our lives exposed, the, the wrinkles and the birthmarks and the family secrets and the family traits, the truth exposed so that we can see it too. How much power does your past wield? I remember one of the first years I, was, uh, I attended our, one of our classes meetings, uh, uh, CRC minister Walt Brower was doing a presentation on emotional health in churches. And, and he pointed out that in kind of standard emotional health inventories, there were usually 19 items listed. And he said, but there are four that outweigh all the other 15 combined. And he said, the four things that outweigh everything else when it comes to our emotional health are peace with our past, peace with our present, peace with our future, and finally, experiencing unconditional love. How much power does your past wield? I mean, some people have a, have a fairly simple theology when it comes to their past. They, they read 2 Corinthians 2, verse, or 5, verse 17 and conclude, I am a new creation in Christ. The old has simply passed away. Christ has transformed my life in many ways, and, and when I became a Christian, everything changed. But Paul tells us the truth is that we are being transformed. And, and that this is a process, and that it takes time, that it takes a lifetime. And so sometimes people will say, say to me something like, well, Joel, maybe my family wasn't perfect and isn't perfect, but, but it's sure a whole lot more together than other people's families. But that's not really the issue, is it? I mean, every family has been damaged by the fall. And like everybody else in the human race, I too descend from the family tree of Adam and Eve. And their intent after they disobeyed God was to kind of shield and defend themselves from God and from each other. And, and the aim when we, when we try to protect ourselves from God and others, it comes up and it manifests itself in so many different ways from things like controlling or fixing or fear or just withdrawing, or ignoring, or denying, either by pacifying or getting over-involved in conflict, in loneliness, or anxiety, or frustration, resentment, blaming, and so on. In the Ten Commandments, there's this, what I think is a pretty provocative statement. God says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And certainly we praise God for the, the positive legacies of our families, which, which last for, for generations and thousands of generations. But we also see here that God says clearly that the sins of those who go before us are passed on to children and to grandchildren and to great-grandchildren and even great-great-grandchildren. Sin passed on to the next generation. And we see the implication in our own lives, right? We, we can't break free from the past apart from understanding those families in which we grew up. And, and unless we, we grasp on some hand the, the power of the past on who we are presently, we'll inevitably replicate those very same patterns in relationships inside and, and outside the church. I guess I, I, I just can't articulate more urgently how this is in our lives. Um, I've quoted Henry Cloud before, but I think he helps. We change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And so if you're hesitant, if you don't really think this is important for you and your life and your life in Christ, if you're agitated even that I'd be pursuing this so far, I invite you to ask yourself what bothers you about it. What do you have to lose? I mean, I think the Bible reminds us again and again of this urgency. Since we have these promises, dear friend, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. A number of years ago, Centennial Christian School put on the secret garden. And in the secret garden, uh, the boy Colin 
If you remember the story, he thinks he's an invalid. Right? He, he can't bear the strong light of day or even the clean open air. He, he thinks that all these things will infect his lungs and kind of snatch his, his life from him. He believes that he's, he's destined to be everlastingly bedridden or at, at best in a few struggling moments out of bed, he'll be bound to a, a wheelchair. And he believes that in part because he's been told that. And he lives a long time this way, kind of kept in this state almost by a conspiracy of adults. Then one day, his orphaned cousin Mary comes along, and, and she sees right through the conspiracy. And in what looks like sheer defiance and, and uh, you know, utter brazenness, she, she tears the shutters and blinds from in front of Colin's windows, and bright sunlight pours into his room through the, the dust, and, and Colin shrieks. She, she throws the windows open, and cool, fresh air swims into the room, and Colin howls. She, she shoes Colin out of bed and Colin yells. And she forces him, even though he's sullen and whining, she forces him into the outdoors and she scolds and coaxes him out of his wheelchair. And there he kind of stands filled with self-lament and he's kind of tottering there, right? But he's standing. And, and he takes one lurching step and then another and, and soon he walks and then he runs and then he skips and then he even dances. Now, at first, when we meet Mary, she seems so callous. But it seems like, as we move through the story, we realize that she is the one who cares most deeply for him. She cares enough to woo Colin into the secret garden. She loves him enough to bring him towards wholeness. She, she knew all along that his bones were sturdy and that his lungs were, were deep and that his muscles were supple and strong. She knew that he was made to live life to the fullest. She knew what it would mean for him to be reborn from above. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I mean, that's, that's an image, a snapshot uh, of the life that Christ calls us into. Christ finds us in our hovel of self-pity, our, our imagined invalidism, our dreary room, and, and he he seems at first kind of gruff, right? He, he strips off the shutters, he, he throws open the windows, he, he rouses us from our beds, he, he pushes us out into the garden, he commands that we walk, he says, come, follow me. But it's all a gift. Right? There's no secret recipe to allowing God to break the power of our past. But there are only baby steps, shutter openings, stirrings from bed, ways to kind of get out into the garden. And of course, it begins with God, right? It's God, after all, who is the one who is the author and perfecter of our birth and our rebirth from above. And abundant life includes honesty with ourselves and with God and with other Christians. Now, there's a few practical ways to kind of go forward um, in, in growing in emotional health. And, and one of the ways I think that has been helpful for me is to, to make a genogram. Right? It's a family tree that kind of lists people in your family of origin and, and how they related to one another and how they related to you. And, and certainly your family tree will probably be a little bit more complicated than Adam and Eve's. But I think it will tell you a few things as you go through the process. Um, another step is to list significant events from your life, from your past, and to consider how they might affect who you are today why you act the way you do today, to, to just list those significant events and to consider them. And then also to pray. Pray about those significant events. Pray about your family of origin. Talk to God. Wrestle with him even over the things in your past that have some power over you. Um, to pray about them. And then finally, to talk about it. To talk about it with other Christians. Uh, a trusted friend, a um, Christian counselor, talk about it in your small group, uh, a conversation with somebody else, your past. It, this could be a, a step for you in kind of growing an understanding of yourself so that you can serve God better. Now, how does God begin to kind of break the power of our past? Uh, for me, there's this story of an old Hasidic rabbi uh, from his deathbed that kind of ring true for me. Uh, 
He said, when I was young, I set out to change the world. And then as I grew older, I perceived that that was maybe a little bit too ambitious, so I set out to change just my state. This too, as I grew older, I realized that was too ambitious, so I set out just to change my town. And when I realized I couldn't even do this, I set out to change my family. Now, as an old man, I know that I should have started by letting God change myself. If I had let God start with me, maybe then the door would have opened to changing my family and the town or the state even. And who knows, maybe I would have even helped to change the whole world. It is so important to understand how our past affects our present ability to love Christ and to love others. And, and John 3 is, if you're aware of these things, it's not the only sighting of Nicodemus that we have in John's Gospel. If you've read through the Gospel of John, you know that Nicodemus also appears once, uh, twice more. Once is in John 7, where, where he actually comes to Jesus' defense, insisting that, that Jesus ought to be treated fairly. And then finally, at the very uh, twilight of John's Gospel, in, in John 19, at the burial of Jesus, John tells us again about Nicodemus. And he went with Joseph of Arimathea to bury Jesus. And this is the, these are the details that were given. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was accompanied by Nicodemus, the same man who earlier had visited Jesus by night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. And we think, can this be the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus under the cover of darkness? Right, John says the one who, who snuck around in the shadows now comes out in broad daylight to pay proper respect to Jesus as king of the Jews. And it was a crazy thing to do. Right? What with that kind of witch hunt that was going on for all of Jesus' followers, but he decided that it was more than worth it. I mean, if anybody could have been shackled from the power of his past, it might have been Nicodemus. And yet, here we see signs in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the gospel of John, we see signs that Nicodemus is reborn from above, that God is breaking the power of his past. And I wonder if when Nicodemus heard the next day that, that some of the disciples had seen Jesus alive again, I wonder if Nicodemus himself wept like a newborn baby. Wouldn't you? I speak these words of new life to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing our response. We'll stand in a moment and sing just as I am.